Thank you so much. I think I'm mostly seeing familiar faces today, but if anyone is um, a newbie to book club and would like to be kept informed about upcoming book club, book club sessions, just drop a message in the chat. We'll add you to the group email. If you'd like to introduce yourself in the chat function, please do so. I think, as I said, many of us are old friends at this point. Um, and also when we open up the discussion, we will have the opportunity um, for everyone to introduce themselves then. Um, we're also monitoring the chat throughout. If you have a burning question before we get to the portion of our program where we um, have um, a more open discussion. And so please feel free to use that. Um, my colleagues and I will be monitoring it. Um, and this will be on CGS's YouTube channel by middle of next week. Uh, so uh, per our usual structure and format, um, Dr. Langley will make a brief introdu introduction of about 10 to 15 minutes um, about the book Abolishing War, which I hope many of you have had the immense pleasure as I have of engaging with over the last week since we announced this book club. Um, and then we will open it up for questions and answers. I kindly ask that at least in the first round, you keep your remarks or your questions to under two minutes to allow for everyone to have the opportunity to take the floor. Um, and um, I or colleagues will interject to ensure that we move things along. Um, does anyone object to that community agreement for the question and answer portion? If you do so, please raise your hand virtually or physically. Seeing none, we'll move ahead. Um, when we get there, um, again, raise your hands virtually or physically. We're usually pretty good at spotting, especially with a crew around this size. And then we'll start at about 10 minutes before the end of our session, um, about 1.20 um, Eastern Standard Time, um, so that we can have any announcements, um, both for CGS events, as well as anything that any of you would like to share with the group um, in terms of upcoming programming, publications, um, anything of that nature. Um, so I kindly ask that you save those comments until the end or put them in the chat with links at any time. Um, so with the housekeeping out of the way, it is now my profound honor to introduce our book club regular, um, who's also joined us multiple times this week. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time, um, Dr. Winston Langley. Um, Winston is the Professor Emeritus of the Department of Political Science and International Relations and a Senior Fellow at McCormick Graduate School for Policy and Global Studies at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. He has taught for over 40 years and served a pro as Provost of the University from 2008 to 2017. Um, and for our purposes, uh, he is a lifelong or at least a longstanding world federalist. And I hope that we I get to engage from that perspective with the powerful ideas in your book, Winston. Um, I will also just uh, tout um, a few more of his uh, books, should you wish to del delve deeper into his bibliography. Mm -hmm. They include Women's Rights in the United States, which won the Gustavus Myers Outstanding Book Award on Human Rights in North Africa, as well as War Between the U.S. and China and While the U.S. Sleeps. I'll uh, put those links into the chat um, for your, your later um, edification. Um, Winston has always had a deep interest in the role of images in human behavior and for years taught a course on the images of world politics through film and literature. And um, well, Dr. Langley, that might be a little bit beyond the scope of today's conversation. I'd be very interested as um, my colleagues and I were discussing our flagship journal, Mondial, and how images um, can tell the story um, of where we are right now as a global community in the future of multilateralism. So with that, Dr. Langley, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being with us. Not at all. And uh, thank you for having me with you. Um, <laughs> I think after that introduction, I might um, have very serious problems living up to it, of course. Um, just by way of a, a bit of background, I, I was born in Jamaica and I'm the beneficiary of both uh, British on uh, uh, American education. And as um, students often are not entirely certain of that which they want to focus on academically, um, I uh, responded to uh, the interest of my uh, parents in uh, uh, becoming a physician 
and so uh, went into the study of biology um, until my final semester of uh, undergraduate education, where a course in the philosophy of biology, uh, among other things, uh, shifted my uh, focus into some broader settings. And from there uh, to European and American diplomatic history, especially during the 19th and early 20th century, and then uh, uh, political science and international relations, and later on uh, a law degree. All of these, I think you're likely to find reflected in the book and in my uh, uh, presentation today. Uh, secondly, the title that the book wears today is not the one that originally I had chosen. The one I chose was Global Governance, <clears throat> the Abolition of War and Human Security. Uh, with the terms uh, uh, human security suggesting that I have skepticism about the idea of state security and uh, think in terms of human security, both on the individual level, uh, the societal level, and the species level. Uh, some of that is also reflected in the book, although the title may not suggest it. Um, finally, why did I uh, choose to focus in this area? Um, I, I felt that colleagues who had uh, written and written uh, in this area to my great benefit, uh, may have overlooked uh, uh, a number of areas um, that ought to be part of any discussion in uh, global governance. And, uh, for example, uh, the role of economics in uh, what we understand to be international relations, I thought it was uh, not sufficiently emphasized the role of psychology, the idea of trust, and uh, uh, how the Westphalian system eroded all of that, uh, the idea of race and its compelling uh, uh, relationship uh, within both the uh, uh, Westphalian and the counter-Westphalian order. So, uh, the book by uh, John Maynard Keynes, The Economic Consequences of the Peace, uh, became a weighty uh, influence on me as I dealt with uh, diplomatic activities. Now, uh, I'm going to do the following. One, I'm going to try to touch on what I understand the Westphalian order to be, what the counter-Westphalian order sought to do, and three, that will be the next discussion, to suggest how the UN can be reformed to create what I call a respectable world federalist structure. Um, <clears throat> By Westphalian order, I mean a, a body of principles and practices uh, which came to define the behavior of states from uh, 1648 to 1945. Um, by the counter-Westphalian order, I will be presenting ways in which those principles uh, were uh, to have been modified and have in some cases been so modified. The first principle in the body of practices has something to do with sovereignty, which speaks of the state as having the highest authority to act within its borders and in relationship to other states. And the idea of that state being somewhat self-determining with an emphasis on state 
as distinct from what we today call nations. The idea was that that sovereignty allowed the individual state to do a number of things, to advance what is considered the state's interest, what we today call national interest, and to advance it in a manner uh, that allowed for very little, if any, consideration to other uh, states. There is also a principle called non-interference within the territory, uh, territorial borders of that state, and uh, what is called territorial integrity, and its political independence. And that was seen as a central principle for the protection of the state. The state could also accredit diplomats, could declare war, and could engage in what is considered a balance of power as a governance mechanism, namely to act in such a manner in forming coalitions to prevent any one state from dominating the system and its principles. This is what dominated human beings throughout the world, and I emphasize throughout the world, because the colonial world also uh, uh, is part of this system, dominated the world for over 300 years, consigning human beings to utmost cruelty, bloodshed, a thirst for revenge, and even genocidal slaughter. With that pattern of behavior, and I emphasize pattern, genocide did not occur for the first time in World War II. It is simply that we refuse to have recognized it in other venues throughout the world. And that it occurred, and I agree that one ought to emphasize it, in Europe, which was seen as the center of what we have come to call cultural enlightenment or civilization. The Westphalian order also was characterized by a number of individuals and groups that saw the inhumane aspects of its development and its practices. Everyone will often quote um, Hans Perpetual Peace as an individual matter. Others will refer to a book that is a novel uh, Bertha von Stuttner, Lay Down Your Arms, as another individual effort. Not mentioned is George Griffith, the angel of revolution, in which he predicted for Europe a military takeover of the world as an angel of revolution. It may have been postponed in some ways, but some of the features identified by Griffith reside with us today. Then we had non-governmental groups, many of them from religious organizations, from lawyer society, others, including the Federalists, playing a major role in seeking to influence the international system. And so we had the Hague Conferences, for example, of 1899 and 1907, a planned meeting again in 1914, but the World War I aborted that effort. You know of the League of Nations and what it sought to do, but 
nothing by way of anything beyond what we call the society of states. And I will want to emphasize that later, the society of states. The Westphalian order also suffered from what I mentioned, the issue of trust. If one wants to understand why World War I understand, uh, uh, developed the way it did, is that the countries of Europe could not trust one another anymore. They had violated all of the promises they had made, many of them secret. And the idea of any cultural legitimacy especially in the area of economic coercion, the rest of the world, um, we had nothing by way of a series of expanding excuses to continue the system. Once human beings admit to themselves that they are not doing what is morally right, they develop a system of expanding excuses to justify what they do. And so part of the Westphalian order is this system of excuses based on what is called human nature. These fixed categories of behavior of which human beings could not improve could not provide an improvement. And I will take us from here into what is called the Counter-Westphalian Order. The Counter-Westphalian Order may be defined primarily as an attempt to find the remnants of community over the battle of society. The society defined in terms of groupings that seek to advance their own interest with very little consideration of others and communities suggesting that we begin with others as we seek to advance our own interests. Central to that element is not simply the coming into being of the United Nations and the creation of six rather impressive organs that are to help deal politically, legally, educationally, broadly, culturally, economically with the world, but its human rights regime. It represented a massive effort to provide a minimum standard of ethics for the global system. And until we see the UN Charter as part of an effort to provide an ethical system to overcome the excuses of the Westphalian order, I think we will be misunderstanding the thrust of the Charter itself. Part of what the book seeks to do is to suggest, suggest that we must wrestle with the substantive character of human rights, not just its procedural elements. The right to religious worship, the right of conscience and religion, the right, the right of free speech, the right to health, among others. Those are all procedural. The substantive element of human rights is one that is designed to suggest that the highest form of relationship that one can have with other human beings is that of citizenship or nationality. The human rights regime says that our highest loyalty and the most refined basis for moral conduct between and amongst one another 
There's the identity called human. Our commitment to the human supersedes our commitment to what is called the citizen. Although the citizen is also human. But it allows for a different category of analyses. And the economic, political, social, cultural, all areas that the UN has sought to touch on. The counter Westphalian order sought to eliminate the most important institution of the Westphalian order, to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. to reaffirm the faith in human rights and fundamental freedom. Something the Westphalian order trampled on throughout the world on an individual and a collective level. To create conditions, notice conditions within which justice can be realized, the those conditions are elaborated and to promote social progress. That is elaborated in Article 55 of the Charter, what would constitute social progress, etc. The counter Westphalian order was not designed to eliminate all aspects of the Westphalian system. It was to contain it and reverse elements of it. Federalists accept the fact that the nation state may be preserved within a global federalist system. And to that extent, part of the Westphalian order would be present within it, but in a modified setting in which the state would be answerable and accountable to another authority. The book goes into, and I will end my presentation shortly, the book goes into the Cold War, the movement for a new international economic order from the global south, the idea of a single conceptual consciousness uh, that should govern the world, and the hierarchy of the mass communication system, and how that is sought to be modified. It goes into the challenges of nationalism, the idea that we cannot get rid of war, and presents arguments against that claim and suggests how the counter Westphalian order can be updated and modified to elaborate a global federalist system. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Langley, for what I can only describe as um, a stirring and deeply resonant opening to our discussion. Um, that should be no surprise from anyone who's engaged with your book, which is equally stirring and resonant. Um, as folks are getting their questions and um, discussion points ready, I might take moderator's privilege. And yes, please do use your applause emojis as you see fit. Um, um, I might take moderator's privilege and, and start us out. Um, you uh, alluded to the 1899 Hague Peace Conference. We're at the 125th anniversary, of course, this year. Yeah. And two of my colleagues and I on the line actually recently returned from Den Haag where we were contemplating inter alia, a next Hague Peace Conference. 
Um, in between these milestones, and in addition to the 1907 conference that you mentioned, of course, we've also had the moment in 1945, we'll be celebrating the 80th anniversary of the United Nations next year. This year was also the 50th anniversary, I think, less remarked upon of the codification of the crime of aggression um, by a UN General Assembly Resolution 3314 which then later formed the basis for the definition that is in the Kampala Amendments to the Rome Statute, um, which uh, were uh, promulgated in 2010, came into force in 2018. Do you think that we are at another moment, another pivot point with the um, wars of aggression going on in the world today? And I also wonder, um, in addition to um, crimes against state sovereignty, which are what are envisioned in uh, the UN Charter, of course, and fundamental to um, the whole project of the United Nations system, if you would have anything to say about non-international armed conflict and wars within states. Um, I see Emma has her hand up, and we'll come to you in a second, Emma, but we've spent some time talking, for example, about conflict in the Cameroons. Um, we can point to any number of non-international armed conflicts raging in the world today. And um, I would wonder what your thesis has to, has to say to them. Um, just as a, a technical point today, we are um, uh, ostensibly covering about the first half of Winston's book, uh, chapters one through six. We're looking forward to our next discussion where we move from diagnosis to prognosis. Um, but of course, do not feel free to confine your comments there. Um, I will go to Winston and then I'll go to Emma and Dave in that order. Um, and if anybody has to drop, I see one friend who I know has to drop. Um, who has experienced litigating uh, the the crime of p uh, to make peace um, a legal right in his country? If he would want to say a word, um, I uh, advise you to raise your hands so we can make sure to come to you before you have to leave us. Winston, please. Thank you. Yes, I I, I think the uh, definition of aggression is one of the most important developments in international relations and. Um, it will serve as a major basis for our operation in the world uh, uh, going forward. It is true that this development does not deal with certain forms of internal conflicts, but that is the next frontier. I think the uh, International Law Commission ought to begin to focus on this area of conflict and to emerge and to uh, shape a, a code by which this too can be outlawed. Um, uh, I don't think it can be any longer tolerated within a system of human rights uh, uh, and uh, the more quickly we direct our attention there, the better it will be for individual countries and the world at large. Don't let us not forget, of course, that these internal conflicts have their spillover effects on international or interstate conflicts. Um, and very often have been the bases. I hope we will not forget Sarajevo uh, in 1914, and uh, what that meant to a system that is already uh, corrupt, but it was part and parcel of internal conflict within the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, and part of its relationship with uh, uh, the Ottoman Empire. Thank you so much, Winston. Um, I will go now to Dr. Emma Alsung, um, one of our previous book club uh, presenters. So I'm so delighted to see authors in conversation with one another. And we'll take both her intervention and Dave's um, so that Winston can consider them both in tandem. Emma, over to you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks, uh, Dr. Lanley, for uh, what I, I think are really some very, very important concepts you've raised. They literally sing to my heart. But one thing caught my attention that I wanted to see if you can explore that a little further in the time that you have. 
And I'm going to try and quote your words here to make my point. So I do so very quickly and not ramble, as sometimes I'm, <laughs> I tend to do. You said the minimum standards of ethics, there, there, there's a need for a minimum standard of ethics to overcome the excesses of the Westphalian uh, world order. And then you said uh, something about the highest form of relationship we can have is that of citizenship. It caught my attention and I wanted to see if you can elaborate on that a little bit and do so within the context of what uh, we just came out of, which is called the summit of the future, right? And all these um, concepts that tend to speak to your counter Westphalian proposals, right? How do you see what just came out of what is dubbed as the age of multilateralism, right? Where we literally are speaking about the set of ethics having to deal with equity, equitable relationships, inclusivity, our uh, inclusive networks, and, and the need for uh, changing that old narrative where uh, the genocides of the, of, the, of the World War II are front and center and present in our minds, but it did not start there, as you mentioned in your book. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Emma. I, I, I thank you for your question, and I hope I was not misunderstood. I was suggesting that the Westphalian order uh, regarded citizenship as the highest form of relationship the individual could have uh, with the state and other citizens, of course, and that the counter-Westphalian order in its uh, uh, minimum standard of ethics is suggesting something to the contrary, that the, the highest level of relationship and loyalty that goes with it also is um, the, uh, the identity that one can achieve and should be recognized as having is that of human. So a human identity is higher than that of a citizenship identity. Although the citizen is also human, the idea is that we are human first before we become citizens. Um, and uh, if, if one goes through a system of ethical reasoning, the, that, the, that the order of being takes precedence over the order of legalities, if you wish. Now, how that fits into uh, what has been uh, the looking into the future in the recent conference, um, I think the idea of the human identity, both on the level of the individual, subgroups which human beings constitute, the nation and the species. The idea that the species identity as a link with the individual, as it were, and that our responsibility is to the identity called human, broadly understood, is consistent with what uh, the future order. It seems to me from all I've read about the conference, or the getting together, if you do not call it a formal conference, uh, seems to be suggesting. Um, I would go further. I would say that the, um, the idea of the human identity is not only consistent with the Darwinian definition of the descent of human beings, Namely, that we should be proud of what we have done thus far. That's Darwin's argument. Because we have moved from uh, a unicellular organism to one that has recognized a broader affiliation from villages to townships to nation states as well. But Darwin says that the, it takes just one additional step to think in terms of the species at large, 
a community with this species. And if we look at all of the great religions of the world, one will find that what in the West we call the golden rule is present in Zoroastrianism, is present in Hinduism, within Judaism, within Islam, et cetera, et cetera. So my response to you is yes, this elementary, this skeletal system of moral norms we call human rights asks us to think of ourselves as, yes, we are citizens of our townships, of our universities, of our, uh, of, of, of our counties, of our na nation states, but in addition, and supervening all of this, we are human. And the latter supersedes all else. It seems to me that that could be um, a central tenet or um, the, the bylaws of uh, world federalism as, as we understand it, um, including not only humanity, but also as we'll engage with next time, um, a spoiler alert, I think, the intersectionality with obligations to the planet. I'm gonna go to Dave Otten next and, uh, and then Roberto. Uh, Professor Langley, I think you've written a great book. And I have a number of reactions to it after having read the first six chapters so far. I think you've done a great job explaining the Westphalian system and the counter Westphalian system. And I think your emphasis on human rights and climate change and, and race is something that was extremely important. Um, I, th I noticed what I consider a few limitations though, and I'd like to mention those. Uh, first is just stylistic. You use an awful lot of uh, acronyms. And I found myself constantly having to go back to page 245 and 246 <laughs> in order to see what you were talking about. You mentioned something in one chapter and then in another chapter, the same acronym, and I have to go back and forth. The my other comment, though, is unlike Ron Gloss's book on confronting war, I didn't notice a definition of war in your book, Abolishing War. Yes. And I think that might have been helpful. Glossop's definition is war is a large scale con violent conflict between groups that our governments are seek to become governments over some territory. And by providing that definition, Glossop then is able to make the transition to world federalism by saying, how do we change violent to nonviolent? The other thing in your first six chapters, I think you, you make a lot of distinctions between confederation and federation, but they are scattered. And in Ron Glossop's book, uh, World Federation, he has a whole chapter on uh, the difference between confederacy and federation and shows that the United Nations is a confederacy itself. And finally, throughout the first six chapters, you have different um, an ex uh, ways in which you talk about the criticisms of the UN system. Um, and in Ron Glossop's book, he has a whole chapter of those criticisms, much more detailed and then on another chapter, responses to those criticisms. So those are just some of the reactions I had in reading the first six chapters, and I, I look forward to reading the rest of the book and talking with you about it next next month. Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I, I do not want to excuse myself because I, I think I, I may be guilty in some form of what, some of what you, you mentioned. Here. The acronyms, uh, you know, the book was... Uh, the publisher um, decided that I needed to eliminate 100 pages uh, from the original manuscript, and it created quite a bit of problems. And <laughs> unfortunately, that's part of uh, the uh, uh, use of the acronyms there. Um, 
uh, the uh, definition of, of war, um, uh, it is true that I did not uh, uh, give what I would consider a, a full-fledged uh, definition because I wanted that to be part of a discussion. Indeed, the idea that war as defined under the Westphalian system is something that itself is flawed. Uh, the first question to me had to do with internal conflicts, as it were, and uh, how do we deal with those? Uh, uh, one of the problems I found uh, in the study of international law was that uh, if, if one studies the US uh, uh, civil war, for example, the point at which Great Britain began to extend aid to uh, the Confederacy and the amount of money Britain had to pay to the United States for that recognition uh, could give us a sense of the, 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 the legal nuances that may be involved here. But I take very much your uh, criticism. Uh, I promise I'll give you a better uh, response in my uh, 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 discussion of the uh, dismantling, I'm sorry, the reforms of the United Nations. Now I see that. And the Confederation Federation, um, yes, I wanted that to be very much part of our, uh, our uh, 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 I didn't know about this discussion, but discussions I might have uh, uh, about the book, because um, if one were to use the US experiment, uh, for example, uh, there were three major areas that uh, the confederal structure that the US had before uh, 1789 uh, uh, proved particular, particularly damaging. That had to do with uh, the regulation of commerce uh, to uh, the issue of the declaration of war <laughs> and uh, uh, the uh, issues of budget. Um, and w people may not know, but uh, 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 Pennsylvania and Delaware, for example, went to war uh, 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 during the period of the Confederacy. New York and New Jersey were uh, uh, moving pretty close to war on who would collect the revenues from the port of New York. Uh, <clears throat> what 1789 did, uh, and of course, the, the the new confederation had to go to the individual states to beg for monies for the operation of the confederal government. What the constitution uh, of the U.S. did, the, the, the uh, 1789 uh, 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 constitution, is to say that the federal government will reg regulate all countries and that it will... It is for Congress, that is the federal government, to declare war. And that uh, the, the federal government is going to be able to establish a budget of its own. Well, if we transfer that to the current United Nations, uh, those are some of the outstanding problems. And uh, indeed, it's very much part of the reforms that I'm going to be suggesting and will be part of our discussion the next time. The European Union, incidentally, is having the same issue. It doesn't have a budget. Uh, that's that's one of the major problems in its weakness in making the next step towards a federation. Thank you. And as I put in the chat, um, I, I don't think Winston is is the only individual and has a much better reason than many of us uh, to uh, for being guilty of alphabet soup. Um, <laughs> and so uh, I always like the little slap on the wrist when I delve too deeply into the acronyms and lean on them too much. Yeah. Um, and just uh, another side remark that I think there are still some of us who are a little bit sore about the um, agreement reached between New York and New Jersey. But then again, it is a 
cottage industry for municipal liability and litigation in my home state and home city. Yes, yes, yes. So yes. it's my, my great pleasure to, to go over to somebody who I think can speak to the fact that the ideas in your book are not utopian, are not theoretical, but are practically achievable. Um, and that's uh, uh, Roberto Zamora from Costa Rica, who is joining us on very short notice on his weekend. So thank you, Roberto. Um, who, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, litigated to have the right to peace within his country's constitution. And then I'll go to Alan Ware and anybody else, please put your hand up who would like to contribute. Roberto, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, uh, Professor, for your insights uh, today. And uh, more than an, an achievement of my my own, what, what I think is, it's important to to highlight uh, the case of, of Costa Rica that not for being small is less sovereign of less important than other states. Um, Costa Rica abolished its army in 1948, became neutral in 1983 and in 2003 decided to support the coalition of the willing that illegally invaded Iraq. And at that moment, I filed suit before the Supreme Court arguing that Costa Rica wasn't legally capable of doing such a thing due to its declaration of neutrality and adherence to uh, the Charter of the United Nations. Now, the court ruled in my favor and declared such support to the coalition of the willing and constitutional. But the court did so on a very interesting legal argumentation because it applied the rule of estoppel. Even when no other country had taken measures uh, to consider itself harmed by the decision of Costa Rica to, against, to go against its, its uh, unilaterally declarated neutrality. Um, the court considered the only thing necessary to apply the rule of estoppel, the principle of good faith. And what these points is that if we really look at it, the only asset we need to really abolish war is in material. Is we wanting to abolish war, particularly international concepts. Um, I think that the, 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 the fundamental flaws uh, that you point are important starting with the fact that the United Nations was created as a partisan organization and only ceased to be so when the former members of the Axis acceded to it. Uh, you can read in Article 107 of the Charter how it doesn't exclude the possibility of taking measures against the former members of, of the Axis. Um, now, when this, the United Nations ceased to be partisan because these countries became part of it, uh, the rules of the game change. And it is, to me, surprising that the International Law Commission didn't recognize as a rule of use Cohen uh, the principle of good faith, which to me is fundamental for the whole functioning of the international concert. And it is, to me, just another show of double standards that still rule on top of law. Um, for instance, that war is outlawed as a rule of customary law and a rule of use Cohen, but peace is not even a legal concept, uh, which to me is uh, quite ridiculous. So I, I just wanted to, to bring um, this uh, example, because as Rebecca said, some of the ideas that you have talked about can actually be real and have actually materialized in the real world, as the case of Costa Rica showed. For the rest, I, I just want to thank you for your time and your insights.
Not, not at all. I, I, I think Costa Rica is an example of what, uh, what we call small states can do in influencing the evolution of international law. I, uh, I think I mentioned Costa Rica specifically in the book uh, uh, because uh, after the adoption of the charter, Costa Rica and a number of states had publicly indicated their willingness to accept far greater UN influence in their lives, uh, the Costa Ricans, than uh, other countries then. Um, I also would like to mention uh, the ruling on the case of Liberia and uh, 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 the case brought by Liberia and South Africa <laughs> I'm sorry, Liberia and Ethiopia against South Africa. Uh, the principle of Estopel was uh, 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 applicable here in the, the one having to do with uh, uh, Ethiopia and Liberia against South Africa, uh, the principle of standing emerged. Uh, can, can, can a country that does not have any of its citizens or doesn't have any of its property uh, being damaged in some way have standing to bring a case against another country. It's the principle of good faith. That's part of what the UN Charter is all about. That's the pledge that countries make when they ratify the charter. And the Japanese judge on the International Court of Justice saw this immediately. He was coming out of a Buddhist tradition, if you follow his, follow his, his, his background. Um, and this influenced some of uh, my own reaction to the qualifications to be considered uh, for uh, judges that may be, uh, 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 people may be considered to be judges in the International Court of Justice. Yes, thank you. Um, two quick comments. In terms of the qualifications of judges before the International Court of Justice, uh, this is something in the longer term that the Legal Alternatives to War program would like to engage with in the same way that civil society animated behind a real reform effort on the um, selection, nomination, and election of judges before the International Criminal Court. Um, we have not seen gender balance. I think there have been six um, out of how many how many judges? Somebody can tell me. Um, over 100 judges at the ICJ that are women over the, the course of its tenure. We had the first women African judge currently sitting on the court. However, I think some of us have been disappointed um, in her jurisprudence thus far. Um, so that's something for which we um, very much wish to advocate for as civil society. Secondly, if anyone is interested in the real life story that uh, Roberto has narrated about his and others advocacy in Costa Rica, uh, there is a wonderful documentary film called A Bold Piece. I think Drea will be able to include the link in the chat. It's rentable on Amazon. Um, our Cincinnati chapter of Citizens for Global Solutions recently organized a screening of this film, and we'd be very, very happy to support any other chapters or anyone else who wants to have a common viewing, but you can all download it and watch it yourselves. Um, I'm going to go to Alan next, and then I have both Joseph Barata and Alberto um, uh, Tina. And Alan, I was wondering, I'm sure you have your own comments and reflections, but as we discussed that um, concept of human security and the individual and the species as an organizing principle, as opposed to state-centric model, I was reminded, of course, of the common security approach, common security versus collective security. And you and I have written and spoken on common security as, a, um, as an alternative to deterrence. But if I kind of look at the grammatical construction of that, perhaps common security 
um, should be weighted against something else. Is it national security? Is it collective security? And where does human security fit in is something that I would love to hear you and Winston engage with, but please, and you might have had other ideas. Well, thank you, Rebecca. I did have another question, but um, on the common security, I will make a short comment on that uh, because we, um, oh, sorry, I should have introduced myself first. So my name's Alan, I'm the Program Director for World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy. Uh, so we're the global coalition of world federalist organizations of which Citizens for Global Solutions is a United States member affiliate. <clears throat> um, thank you for mentioning Law Not War, Rebecca, because that's one of our flagship programs, Legal Alternatives to War, which is focusing on the important role. I'm not hearing. You're not hearing? Um, I was hearing all right, maybe a little faint. Maybe you could come a little bit closer to wherever your microphone is or just speak up a little bit. <clears throat> okay, sorry. I, I, I've been told I normally shout. Is this better? Can you hear better? Yeah. That is much better. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm Alan Ware, uh, Program Director for World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy, uh, which is a, the global uh, coalition of federalist organizations from around the world and Citizens for Global Solutions uh, is the US member or affiliate. Um, thanks, Rebecca, for mentioning Law Not War, Legal Alternatives to War. Um, my question is going to be on that, but Rebecca's also asked me to comment just briefly on the common security framework because that's something which our organization, in cooperation with others, uh, including the Interparliamentary Union, we've got a program now on common security is advancing, um, which is very much the idea that the security of a nation or an individual or a peoples is not uh, is not achieved, especially not sustainable security, uh, by dominance, by military might, by threatening the security of others. Our, our sustainable security is, is obtained by ensuring that everybody's security is met. This is the foundation for the UN Charter. It's why the UN Charter includes the prohibition on the threat or use of force in international relations and the requirement that member states need to resolve their conflicts peacefully and includes mechanisms for doing that. So the UN is basically a common security mechanism. It's not the only one. There are other ones as well, but it's a, a primary one. Um, so I will put in, when I finish talking, the link to our common security platform so you can see more about that. Uh, we're doing, as I said, programs, particularly with the Interparliamentary Union, but also with the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which was also set up as a common security um, organization. Now to my question uh, for Professor Langley, uh, which is on the key, the principal institutions for like a world federalist government. Um, and I would say, I mean, there are many models, but from my perspective, they should reflect the general key institutions for any government. The three main ones are a strong executive, a legislative or, or parliament institution and a judiciary. Um, and you correctly report that the United Nations is not a world federation. <laughs> these, these institutions are not of the nature. But I want to ask specifically on the judiciary, because for the executive and the legislative, I would agree UN reform would be required or a new UN charter would be required in order to move to a world federalist governance. But on the judiciary, maybe we don't need UN reform because we already have the basis of a working judiciary, the International Court of Justice, uh, for example, the, the judiciary is an independent judiciary. It applies a law which is uh, you know, binding on countries, plus also legal opinions. The thing that's missing for the International Court of Justice is universal compulsory jurisdiction. So if we could achieve compuls universal compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice, we've got a key judicial organ. There's also the International Criminal Court, which is for individual responsibility. Again, if we are working more towards you know, uh, uh, a universal ratification, I think we're building judicial organs. There are also other judicial areas, for example, environment. There's a proposal for an international environment court. There's also a proposal for an international anti-corruption court. So my mind's with these proposals, and I'd like your comment on that. Do you think it's possible to build the judicial, judicial aspect of, of world federalist government without necessarily having 
to to have UN reform. We can actually, and we can do that now. And that's part of sort of, I think, the objective of Law Not War and also the Impact Coalition on Just Institutions, which mm -hmm. Rebecca is, uh, and I and Roberto uh, are, are co facilitators of. Thank you. Yes. I, uh, I, I think that um, the independent judiciary uh, uh, for any uh, world government will be um, necessary. Um, simply saying an independent judiciary, uh, however, uh, must also include uh, the cultural um, consensus that the court represents, meaning from where are the judges recruited? From what cultural mix? So that a decision made by the court will have the broadest legitimacy, cultural, political, legal, etc. Uh, we have many systems of law throughout the world. The court thus far has been dominated by the uh, civil law and common law system with uh, a few additions from the rest of the legal systems of the world. So, yes, I would say that pushing for uh, compulsory jurisdiction is a course of action that uh, commends itself to the improvement of the world order we are, are seeking. But along with that, I would like to see a number of other issues addressed. There is one item that is sometimes forgotten in our discussions of, the, of international law. It is that in the Westphalian order, individuals were not subjects of the law. They were, they were like um, ships, objects on which the law operated, but the individuals had no legal agency. Part of the coming of the human rights regime, the counter-Westphalian order, is that individuals do have some agency. And the ICJ, when it came into being, it reflected more an adoption of what had emerged in the League of Nations, namely the Permanent Court of International Justice, with a slight modification. I don't think that the issue of um, human rights, for example, played any role in shaping the International Court of Justice. So um, with that sort of um, uh, 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 exception, I, I support the idea very much of the compulsory jurisdiction and the, uh, the fact that it could take us in a rather uh, uh, important direction for uh, a common and collective future. I believe we actually have three um, outstanding um, uh, questions. Virginia, I see your hand, but earlier I was told that Alberto um, wanted to make an intervention and then Alimi and then uh, Virginia in that order, unless um, hands have been lowered, uh, indicating that you no longer wish to, to intervene. Um, Alberto, are you with us? Would you like to take the floor? Can I just say Joseph had his hand up? Oh, yes, and Joseph, I'm so sorry. Um, I think it was actually Alberto, Joseph, Alimi, Virginia. My apologies, Joseph. Oh, no, oh. I've, I've lowered my hand. Oh, okay, well, um, I don't see Alberto coming through. So if you if you did want to intervene, we would go over to you directly. Joseph, but no? No. 
Okay. Um, and my apologies again for getting the, the order um, incorrectly. Um, Alimi, did you want to come in? I saw your hand was lowered also. Otherwise, we'll go to Virginia. Um, I think Alimi has put his question in the chat. Um, given the growing clamor for systemic adjustment at the international level and the growing role. Oh, Alimi, you're with us. Did you want to ask your question yourself? Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, it's okay. Please you can introduce go on. yourself as well. We're very delighted to have you. All right. Thank you, Rebecca, for this opportunity. My name is Alimi Salifu from Lagos, I'm leading partnership for future generations in Africa and the co lead of the Impact Coalition for Future Generations. So, I think this discussion is quite important for us, young people and future generations, because we have seen the impact of intergenerational wars in the Middle East, you know, in every part of the world. So we wonder, you know, how we can shape the narrative, you know. So the question I put in the chat is, you know, we want a better international order because, for instance, I couldn't attend the UN you know, Summit of the Future because of the systemic injustice, you know. So how do we change the narrative as young people? I'm sure maybe the chat, the message might be, you know, clearer than what I want to say. So please, uh, Rebecca, you can read the message. Thank you. Um, thanks. And for anyone who's not looking at the chat, um, the message that Alimi has sent is given the growing clamor for systemic adjustment at the international level and the growing role of young people in Africa in the clamor, how can we get the buy-in of African decision makers for a just rule-based order where humans are at the center of state policy at the international level? And I hope I did justice to your question, Alina. Um, we'll go to Winston for his uh, comments. And then um, uh, Alimi, please let me know if Alberto still wants to intervene, but I'll go to Virginia next. Yes. Um... Uh, and thank you for your 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 question. Um, I do think that uh, Africa uh, has a very important role to play within the global system, apart from uh, the political one that is often cited, uh, namely uh, a a rather strong emphasis on community through uh, traditional African uh, uh, systems. Uh, that ought to be part of our understanding of human rights in as much as the thrust of emphasis in human rights has been that of the civil and political rights category in contrast to the economic, social, and cultural rights uh, area. Uh, making these two areas co-equal, as they are in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, is part and parcel of our uh, common future. And I think Africa has a very important role to play here. Secondly, at the political level, this is doubly important because from all of the demographic information we have, by 2050, Africa will have an overwhelming number of young people uh, as a percentage of the world's young. And it's say will have a bearing on our collective future also. Recently, there has been some discussions about having Africa gaining a, a seat as a permanent member of the Security Council. I have a strong dissent here, as will be seen in my next discussion. I do not think that we should add to the permanent membership of the UN. It is contrary to all other norms to which the United Nations claims to be committed. It comes from uh, what I call the hereditary principle, the monarchical principle, where um, 
uh, one could enjoy a status, in this case states, generation of the generation of the generation, regardless of their behavior. Uh, what I propose instead is to add members to the Security Council with a longer non-permanent tenure. Six or eight year terms to be reelectable based on their conduct during this time in implementing the norms of the Charter. Um, so, yes, I do think Africa as a whole, we have a, a African Union, the uh, European Union has uh, 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 at least one, uh, France, and uh, depending on where Britain goes, uh, it may very well be voting with Europe. Uh, one can say uh, Africa may have a, a, a comparable standing. But don't forget that if we say that, we'll have to deal with the, uh, uh, South America, and uh, uh, other areas of the globe, South Asia, for example, uh, uh, accordingly. Because the issue of equity here should be part of the bearing in all our considerations. The third matter uh, <clears throat> has to do with uh, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Um, uh, that uh, document, uh, ought to become uh, a, a stronger uh, um, part of uh, international and global discourse. And I expect that uh, the legal mechanisms within that charter will also allow for an important uh, voice in world affairs um, in anticipation of what will be discussed next year, next time, uh, I do call for a, a, um, a, a human rights court at the global level. And the World Court for Human Rights is a project that is championed by, by one of our board members and, and dear friends, um, uh, uh, David Gallup and the World Service Authority. We can include a link to the chat. We've also included the links in the chat to proposals for an international anti-corruption court and an international environmental court. I do have two interventions. Virginia, if you'll forgive me, I'm gonna go to Alberto first because he's had some problems getting unmuted. Um, and so just in the interest of making sure that with the connection that he has, um, he's able to intervene, but we will not forget you. I'm, I'm so sorry to make Hello. you wait. <laughs> Thank you. Alberto? Can you uh, hear me now, Rebecca? Yes, yes. Please go ahead. Can and you hear me now? Oh, yeah. Good. Good. Yes. Uh, so my name is Alberto Portuguese, and uh, I'm now right now speaking from Argentina, Buenos Aires, where I, I live in London, the UK, and uh, I would like to ask, I would like to first thank everybody for the contributions, but I would like to ask how, um, or, or more than ask, I would like to, it's a question that I ask myself all my life. I mean, I'm now over 80 years old, and uh, I speak to politicians the world over because I'm a pianist by profession and I traveled a lot, and I spoke to many politicians, to many diplomats, and nobody can give me an answer to the question, how can we make a, a live in a world of peace when governments are supposed to be promoting the war industry? And uh, the, the, only, the only people in the world who can authorize the, the uh, or the business of war, ex exports and imports, are politicians. And politicians are the only ones who can order armed forces to act. So what is the, how can they organize? They are not producers of miracles. To me, to have a war industry and expect that we live in peace, it's, it's absurd. It's the same as, as promoting uh, the manufacturing and selling 
of music instruments, of uh, of music schools, of piano, uh, of music teachers, train people to play the instruments, and then expect government to ban music. It's, it's totally absurd. To me, it's not abolition of war. To me, it's abolition of militarism, or abolition of armed forces, abolition of of uh, the war industry. The war industry only exists for that purpose. There is, it's a waste of time. I, I've been all my life saying this, and, and but people still, still, so many people believe that uh, armies give us security and protection. And this is absurd, because they, if I had a, 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 a factory manufacturing bombs, I would need government to organize wars so that I can pay my employees. There is no alternative from an economic point of view. And we also ruin all economies, because all the econ United States is at the moment in 35 or over 35 trillion dollars in the red. But the, the economy in all countries will never, never, never be right when we have this uh, obscene military expenditure. We have countries that have, people die because they have no the right medicines or the right machines in hospitals. Uh, we have an uh, illiteracy in many countries where the United Nations has only manufactured war since they exist. The, the, the League of Nations uh, organized World War II and, the, and, and now the United Nations is organizing World War III. All wars in the world are carried out by uh, uh, United Nations countries. So how can we think that the United Nations is for peace? Did it, it's not, it's not it's, whether the United Nations or not United Nations it doesn't make any difference. The war industry exists for that. We pay the scientists to make better bombs, more powerful bombs, more sophisticated bombs. Now, because so many people uh, refuse to go to the army, we have uh, asked scientists to make drones and to make all kinds of uh, uh, automatic equipment so that we don't need so many. Also, because so many men have decided not to join the army, uh, we have uh, uh, encourage women to enjoy to to join. Now we have uh, in Canada, for instance, the, the minister uh, of the defense. Uh, 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 sorry, the head of the uh, report is the woman. Gracias. Alberto, muchas gracias. I wish you could see the nodding heads, and if you're not able to access the chat, you've also had um, some concurrence. I think uh, there have been heart emojis um, in with your powerful words of how much you are speaking for others in the room. But just in the interest of time, as we're coming towards the end of our session, I'm going to go over to Dr. Langley for his reaction to your powerful words, and then to our last contribution from Virginia before we wrap up. Thank you so much, Alberto. I hope that we have the opportunity Thank to you, welcome. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you for your, your comments and your question, uh, Alberta. Um, in the book, I spend, uh, uh, there's an area that uh, focuses on the opposition to the abolition of war. And one of the uh, groups uh, that I uh, target happens to be the what I now call the military industrial complex, uh, now expanded to uh, include the military industrial, the media academic complex, uh, because it's the idea is that the military has uh, broadened its influence in many other areas within uh, society. Um, and one of the arguments here is an economic one, which says that even if war could be abolished, it would be undesirable. And the reason why it is undesirable because of the likely economic impact that abolition would have on society. 
The argument is that governments every year spend an immense amount on the military and military associated activities that represents a steady economic stream within society. To get rid of that permanent support to society at large is to risk the type of economic disturbance that would be a disaster to, for everyone. So I have taken that into consideration in the book and indicate that indeed one of the reasons for summoning a broad-based opposition to war and not relying on political leaders is to ensure that those over whom the military has the greatest influence do not continue to shape our policy. Non-governmental organizations, young people, those who wear the consciousness of you, Alberta, that's part of where our future lies. Thank you. And I think that will be the crux of our next session. Virginia, over to you with a last comment slash question. Thank you so much, Winston. What a joy to be with you today and to celebrate this new book. I'm so grateful to be here. I just wanted to say Joseph has is ill, so that's why he had to leave and he couldn't ask his question. Oh. I'm sure he'll be back next time. I hope so. <laughs> yes. Um, but I just want to build on what you just said and remind Rebecca, and I'm sure you, this was just, maybe I didn't hear you, but I think you may not have said that in 1999, there was a Hague appeal for peace with NGOs. Yes, um, yes. What, I wanna highlight that, I was there. And I wanna just say how important it was for the people, highlight, you know, building on what you just said. And also without um, UN reform, we have a, security system embedded in the charter that many people forget about. It's chapter six, article 33. Yes. So why not, why not we focus on that right now? Because that is something in place. We don't need any more. Um, I've I focused on that for 30 years in my work there. And I just wanted to mention that um, the mention of trust is very important to me, Winston. So I hope that you'll embellish on that maybe in the next session. Yes. Um, and also um, reframing political will in the terms of Rousseau, the will of the people. We don't have to go by the definition of political will that the Security Council doesn't doesn't uh, use. So I'm also aware when you when I look at Chapter Six, Article Thirty Three that. Their stages of conflict are all, there's a healthy level of conflict, uh, level one and two, which is all already in the charter. So it has to be actually taught to people that there is a healthy level of conflict and they can live by that. So um, I think that the power issue of states can be addressed uh, by this uh, reframing of Rousseau but I also um, hope that you'll you'll embellish on the trust that you mentioned and also the role of NGOs. Yes. Um, I, I'll begin with the role of NGOs. Uh, uh, something I did not say um, in the coming into being of the counter-Westphalian order, if one were to look at the draft of the UN Charter coming out of Dumbarton Oath in uh, 1944, and look at the Charter coming out of San Francisco, one will have a better sense of the role of NGOs in transforming the Charter. Do you know that despite all of the clamors during the war about human rights, there was a single reference to it in the proposal coming out of Dumbarton Oath. 
And that was one introduced by the Soviet Union, having to do with economic rights. Nowhere else was there any mention of it. It was the NGOs in San Francisco who say you will never get any support for this document and send a greater focus on human rights. And therefore, you will see the great transformation in the Charter, plus the promise, because what NGOs wanted was a specific, separate document. They got a promise. And the promise is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that it would come after the conference. So I, I would like to underline that as part of a major contribution of NGOs to the Charter of the United Nations and the normative order we associate with the, the, the uh, 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 counter-Westphalian system. On the matter of, of, of uh, uh, trust, that is something I cannot emphasize enough. And I hope to move more deeply into it in our next discussion because of how it will play an overall role in the movement toward what I hope will be a, a, a global federal order. Uh, absent trust, we don't have very much at all. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, trust on which the idea of good faith is built. It, it's all part of the law uh, that we have such respect for, but that law is grounded on trust. The moment people begin to, 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 to doubt the, the impartiality of the law, uh, then we have very little trust within society. Uh, chapter six, yes, that's for next uh, uh, area of discussion. And I very much know uh, your reference to the non-Pacific modes of dispute settlement to which Article 33 refers. That too, yes, will be part of our, our, our discussion. And thank you. Uh, thank you both. Thank you, Virginia, for co uh, correcting my oversight, not mentioning the 18, uh, the 1999 Hague Appeal for Peace. Alan has put the details in the chat. This was, of course, um, a project, among others, of the World Federalist Movement. And when I referenced our recent trip to the Hague, um, it's very much looking at a follow-up and what the next Hague Appeal, Appeal for Peace or Peace Conference could look like. Um, our next session with Winston will be on December 14th. Um, coincidentally, I think the day that the UN General Assembly met for the first time, also the date the Dayton Peace Accord was signed, very important peace treaty in a part of the world where I've spent a lot of time. I will try to join you as best I can. I may be joining from another area of the world that is undergoing conflict in the Caucasus, um, but we very much look forward to the discussion. In between then and now, we also have an event on November 14th on the Global Peace Index um, for 2024 um, with the executive director um, of the organization that promulgates that important document, which is just a phenomenal research endeavor. Um, and I would welcome anybody else to plug any events or um, publications or other um, uh, notions of interest um, for those collected here today. Other than that, it just remains me for me to thank our illustrious speaker for your incredibly thought-provoking and I would say action-oriented um, comments and time that you've spent with us today, as well as all of you who've joined us globally this time. We're delighted to see the book club expanding um, and diversifying in new directions. Um, and thank you for the perspective that you bring. I'm gonna ask now if I don't see any raised hands for any announcements that the recording be stopped.